17 guys in a room, in a government building, in an air-conditioned room, 17 guys, I emphasize, guys, there wasn't a single woman, had a heated debate for hours on whether women are poor. Yeah. Don't look so shocked. Finally, we decided that you were. Okay? Because three of us held out boldly. And the, what, when we, our argument, the three of us were arguing that in rural India, women-headed households have to be automatically declared below poverty line. There's no need of a survey. All the evidence of NSS and other studies show us that. The secretary of one of the biggest departments of government in India attacked me saying, oh, so then tomorrow I will also declare that my head, household is female-headed. Actually, I think it would be a damn good idea if his household were female-headed. <laughs> his wife has certainly a lot more brain than he does. 19% of all Indian rural households are female-headed. That's the official census figure of the last census. However, in areas like Anantapur, Kalahandi, where migrations are large, the percentage of female-headed households crosses 50%. Okay? And at least we were an improvement on the previous census. You know how they used to count whether women were poor or not? They had actually a sheet, a mark sheet. One sari household, one to two saris, two to three saris, what happens if the household had six girls? They'd be wealthy. Right? I mean, this was, I'm not saying that was the sole indicator, but it was certainly, we saw that sheet. I mean, I had never known of this until I was a member. Anyway, unfortunately for the government of India, we decided that 50% of the population were below the poverty line, which infuriated them. It infuriated me too, because I agreed with the first report. Therefore, the biggest annexure in this report is my note of dissent. Third commission, Dr. Suresh Tendulkar, classic champion of neoliberalism. And he gives a figure 14% higher than the government of India. So this is what has happened in four years' time on rural poverty. Okay? He's saying 42% for rural poverty. 42, yeah, for rural poverty, government of India is about 34. Government of India's overall percentage is 27. Tendulkar places it at higher and he places rural poverty at 42%. So even their hand-picked commissions are telling them that the situation has got much worse. Let me leave you with one thing. All of you know of, all the Indians here know of Ajanta and Elora Caves. Do you know how you go there? You go there via a town called Aurangabad. Aurangabad is one of the poorer, it's part of Maratwada, which is one of the poorest regions of the state of Maharashtra. The per capita income of this region is much lower than the state average, much lower than the national average. The state average in this case is higher than the national average. But there's incredible money to be made. What did we begin with, with Warren Buffett's buying opportunities? When there is that much misery, there's an incredible amount of money to be made. Okay? A handful of businessmen are walking into the Guinness Book of Records. Did you read about it? In October 2010, the biggest sale ever made by Mercedes-Benz on a single day to a single group. 150 Mercedes-Benz were bought in a couple of hours by a group of businessmen in one of the poorer parts of the country. You know who, you read about it, right? Do you know who paid the money for it? What it was worth? I heard SBI, was the SBI covered most of the loan. S sorry. SBI is the biggest in terms of branches, maybe the biggest bank in the world in terms of number of branches. State Bank of India is a nationalized public sector bank and it gave them interest rate of 7%. Out of the 640 million rupees that the deal cost, it gave them 440 million rupees. Most of those guys are politically connected. They will never repay that loan. We know them personally. They will not repay the loan. And they got seven. Now the rival town of Kolapur in western Maharashtra is planning to buy 150 BMWs. Why, why should they be? We are making a lot of Germans very happy. <laughs> okay? So this is, look at the fact that the same bank which gave a 7% interest loan on a Mercedes Benz charges 14% interest in the same branch of the bank for a farmer buying a tractor. 
and the cost of a tractor is much less, a hell of a lot less. It's about five, about half a million rupees. How, how, about 600,000 rupees max for a good one. I mean, that's how much you'll get as a max in the loan anyway. Okay? So look at this. 7% for Mercedes-Benz, 14% for a tractor, and if you're a poor woman enjoying that wonderful myth and romance of microfinance, what is the interest rate you pay there? 36%. 36%. No, it's that SHGs and MFIs, microfinance institutions, lend to women. Okay? And the rent rates are typically between 24 to 36%. Very often there are concealed costs. The microfinance miracle was started by poor women two decades ago. It's now completely hijacked by who? Corporations. The same banks, bureaucracies, and moneylenders whom they sought to avoid our Citibank is a big force in microfinance. ICICI is a big force in microfinance. World Bank, Government of India, State Bank of India are a big force in microfinance. By the time the interest rate goes through many major intermediaries and reaches that woman in the village, it's 36%. Andhra Pradesh has brought legislation to curb racketeering by, and many of the farm suicides in Andhra Pradesh in 2010 were linked to microfinance-related suicides because their reposition methods are worthy of credit card sharks. Okay? This is the level, this is the, the kind of situation that you're facing. How has it come about? What can you do about it? I believe in the last 20, 25 years, the policy, econ, packages of economic policies have been entirely McDonald's packages. They taste the same everywhere, whether in India or the United States. Very briefly, these, these processes. One, the withdrawal of the state from sectors that matter to poor people. The state hasn't faded away. It's become more interventionist than before, but it withdraws from sectors that matter to poor people. Two, imposition of user fees and charges on people who can't afford it. Three, the privatization of just about everything, including intellect and soul. You know, 20 years ago, I used to be very curious about this term, public intellectual. What's a public intellectual? Now I figured out that I am, because the rest have gone private. <laughs> yeah. So those of us who haven't been sold to a corporation, we are public intellectuals. It somehow gives us a certain noble transcendence. Doesn't help one bit, though. But fourth, and this is central to what has happened in the last 30 years, the untrammeled, unrestrained rise of corporate power. Whether it's water, whether it's food, whether it's banks, whether it's newspapers, corporations run the world. They run governments. They run your life. The suborning of local governance and elected, elected governments and elected uh, representatives by corporations, by corporate power, and through bypassing. The biggest ambition, I, you know, for many years I've been teaching at the IAS Academy, the Lal Bahadur Shastri Academy in Masuri where we train people for the Indian Administrative Service. Last two years, somehow I haven't gone because I've been too tied down. But I've been doing that since 95. You run there into probationers with all the idealism that young people have. Some of them become excellent collectors. But 10 years down the line, everybody has one ambition, how to get deputed to World Bank or to IMF. That is the ambition. So you're having a complete suborning of the government, governmental processes. Incidentally, the Prime Minister of India, the head of our planning commission, all are former World Bank IMF employees. Yes, Manmohan Singh, Montek Singh, Aluwalia, all of them are former. They draw pensions from the World Bank. Do you know that? Go and read their CVs. Okay. Here's the good news for you. It's unraveling. It's unraveling and not just on the Arab street. The 2008, the meltdown of 2008 did not begin in September 2008. It did not end in January 2010. A hundred countries had had their meltdowns, but it's only when it hits the suits on Wall Street that you call it a crisis. Okay? When it hits the big boys, then it's a crisis. 
if it just wipes out thousands and hundreds of thousands of small farms in Minnesota, Oklahoma, and other and you know Midwestern states of the United States, that's not a crisis. It's when it hurts the corporations that it becomes a crisis. Okay? The fact is, it's unraveling. They don't know what to do about it. They have no clue. They seem to be in charge. They seem to be in command. Military power is the answer, of course, to everything that they do. But they are just not in control anymore. It's not just the Arab street. People are protesting. Things are unraveling. You know, Two conditions are fulfilled. The ruled are no longer willing to be ruled in the old way. The rulers are not able to rule in the old way. How we take it from there, I hope you and I will find a way of agreeing on what to do. I think this is a unique profession, if you want to call it a profession, in one sense. Wherever I go in the world, I go to a newsroom. The most cynical old bloke who's sitting in the corner, if you ask him why he joined the profession, you will trace it to an idealistic origin. Okay? I see the kids, I've been teaching journalists for 25 years. The kids in my class, they didn't go, why didn't they go into advertising? They're, they're very bright. They make much more, they make 12, 15 times the money in advertising. Why did they go into journalism? Because they go into journalism trying to connect to society, trying to change something. Now for me, I would tell you, never mind, let people scoff. There is nothing wrong in wanting to change the world. And you're a moron if you don't want to. Okay? But you're a, you get into a serious problem if you think you're changing it all on your own. Then you become a terrible bore. If you see yourself as part of many things that are going on, as part of the movements for struggling, the struggling for change, you will find yourself. Now, in, in the getting into the media, getting a job and holding on to it, you've not only got to be idealistic and smart, you've also got to be pretty clever about how to swim. A lot of the challenge of journalism in our time is how to increase the public space in a private forum. You're pushing the envelope, you're pushing the borders. Someday, you'll get guillotined. It's a kind of guerrilla journalism. When they burn one forest, you run to the next. Yeah? And there will be times when you get into serious trouble. I wish I had been more clever in my 30 years. I wasn't. I was pretty stupid many times. And I got into serious. Sometimes I think I could have handled it more smartly. You can. The, another thing is, remaining in the profession, in the mainstream, try in being in the mainstream and keep your hooks in to every other kind of journalism that's going on. None of us has the luxury to be a one-dimensional journalist anymore. You have to be your own photographer, your own videographer. And that's how newspaper business is going. I'm very valuable to my paper. I take all my own photographs, so they save tickets on photographers. And, and anyway, they save the belly aching of the photographer who doesn't want to go to a village anyway. Okay? So, you make yourself invaluable in that profession by being multi-skilled, you know, and you push the envelope in every little way you can. You subvert things, you, you uh, push those frontiers and borders as much as you can. Be in the mainstream if you can, until you get slaughtered. Um, <laughs> but connect with alternatives, with groups, with things, online, alternative, whatever. But don't get yourself into a ghetto. Try for the widest possible direction and intervention. It's never been easy. It has been done. So that much you know. It won't be easy. It can be done. You'll do it.